Things with Wings, 1934. When we got down off the train, Grandma was there on the platform. After our first visit, she never met us on the train, figuring we could find our own way. But here she was, under her webby old black umbrella to shade her from the sun. But she wasn't there to meet us. She was seeing somebody off. A lady was climbing up into the car behind ours. We caught only a squint in the dazzling light, but we knew the hat. It was Mrs. Effie Wilcox. With a powerful arm, Grandma swung Mrs. Wilcox's bulging valise aboard, then a picnic hamper. She stepped back at, as the bluebird pulled out. She didn't wave, but scanned the windows to see if Mrs. Wilcox found a seat. Then Grandma turned to us. You never could never call her a welcoming woman, but today her mind was truly miles away. I was falling behind with our suitcase, though this year I was nearly as tall as Grandma herself. Was Miss, Mrs. Wilcox going on a trip? Mary Alice inquired. She's gone for good, Grandma said, off to double up with her sister at Palmyra. The bank's foreclosing on her house, so she lit out not wanting to watch them dump her stuff in the road. After Wilcox died, she left the farm and bought that house in town, but she can't keep up with the payments. At noon dinner that day, Mary Alice and I distracted Grandma with all the excitement we'd left behind in Chicago. In July, they'd killed John Dillinger, public enemy number one. He'd been on a long spree robbing banks throughout the Middle West. The public didn't know whether they wanted him caught or not. He provided a lot of entertainment in hard times. Since he stole from banks, he was called Robin Hood, though he wasn't known for giving to the poor. He'd gone to a picture show at the Biograph Theater not far from our neighborhood. With him were two bad women, and one of them tipped off the cops, who filled him full of lead on the sidewalk. Then to prove they'd finally nailed John Dillinger, the police put his body on display in the morgue basement. People trooped past for a look. Women dipped their handkerchiefs in his bloody wounds for souvenirs. But he was so bloated and shot up that some people said it wasn't Dillinger at all. Rumor had it that he was holed up somewhere. Mary Alice and I sulked because neither mother nor dad would take us to view the riddled corpse. Recalling to ourselves shotgun Cheatham, we thought we could take it. When we got back to school in September, everybody would say they'd seen the cadaver. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity lost. I'd have took, took, took you, Grandma says. We didn't doubt it. Grandma wouldn't have minded a look for herself at all that remained of John Dillinger. Mary Alice and I went upstairs to sort out our clothes from the single suitcase. She was getting particularly about how everything she wore had to be hung up on a hanger just so. Grandma's Mrs. N Mrs. Wilcox, she mentioned. Are you kidding, I said. She's Grandma's worst enemy. She says Mrs. Wilcox's tongue is attached in the middle and flaps at both ends. The town will be quieter without her, and Grandma will like that. You don't know anything, Mary Alice said. Men don't have any idea about women. So I loped uptown by myself, heading for Veach's Gas and Oil, which was man's country. Ray Veach ran the garage when his dad was farming and thought I had some business with him. The town was half asleep with August and the depression. A checker game was going on at the Coffee Pot Cafe as I went past, but nothing else. A knot of people outside Moore's store waited for the day old bread to go half price. In the window at Stubbs and Askew, the insurance agency, you could put up handbills. The biggest was a drawing of a giant farm implement shed that Deer and Company was proposing to put on the block where the old brickyard had been. Next to it, a handbill advertised a rummage sale at the United Brethren Church. Bring and buy, treasures, trash, bric-a-brac, down to earth prices, lunch provided by Our Lady's Circle. The last handbill was a schedule of the movies the Lions Club was showing at their outdoor picture show. They weren't new movies. Some of them weren't even talkies. It looked like a slow week. 
I crossed the Wabash tracks, past the green elevator, on my way to Veach's garage, eating the dust of the trucks hauling in the beans. Veach's garage had been the blacksmith shop, and they still kept the anvil inside. Now it was a one-pump filling station with an outdoor lift. I blundered along toward it, and then the dust cleared, and I saw her. It was love at first sight, like I'd been waiting for her all my life. She stood on the pavement in front of Veach, shimmering in her loveliness, and so graceful she might glide past me as if I wasn't there, leaving me in the dust. She was showroom fresh, a Terraplane 80 from the Hudson Motor Car Company, a four-door sedan, tan with red striping and another touch of red on the hubcaps. Tears sprang and my eyes stung. I couldn't help it. My hands curled like I had her steering wheel in my grip. No car company had an agency in Grandma's town, nor even Ford. But Veach's would order you a car. Ray had said nobody had bought one in two years. He ducked out from under an ancient local mobile, up on the lift, working a greasy rag over his big hands. Ray was 17 and man-sized, and I'd worked hard to know him because I wanted him to teach me how to drive. He'd given me a couple of lessons last summer, but he wanted $2 for the full course. People around here didn't overreact when they hadn't seen you for a year. Ray jerked a thumb back at the local locomobile he'd been working under. He threw a rod. I nodded like I knew, but I couldn't take my eyes off the terraplane. Somebody order this? Ray rubbed his stubbled chin with the back of his hand in a way I admired. Who's got $795? This baby's top of the line. Son, it's got a radio. I wanted to ask him if he'd driven it, but that was too close to asking him for a ride and a lesson. We both knew that I didn't have $2. Hudson's sending out their new terraplane models to drum up interest. It's the make that Dillinger drove to outrun the cops. But hey, you know that, Ray said. You probably took a gander at the body in Chicago, the co Chicago cops put on display. You reckon it was really Dillinger? I shrugged. I could see this was the summer when I missed out on everything. That night after supper, Grandma said, I suppose you kids want to go to the picture show, meaning that she wanted to go to the picture show. We were willing, though going to the pictures for us was the Oriental Theater in Chicago featuring a first-run movie, a pipe organ, and a stage show with a dog act. It was different at Grandma's. On Wednesday nights, the Lions Club sponsored a picture show in the park. They put up canvas walls so it was like a tent without a roof. You sat on benches and they showed the movie on a sheet hung from the branch of a tree. Everybody but the Baptists came. Admission was a nickel a head or a can of food for the hungry. Grandma took a quart mason jar of her beets, and we three got in on that. Since nobody liked sitting behind Grandma, we settled in the back row. There was some socializing she didn't take part in. Then the projectionist got the film threaded, and the show started. Mary Alice had been hoping for Shirley Temple, but it was a Dracula, not too old, starring Bella Lugosi. I have to say, it got to me, all those living dead people with black lips. When Dracula turned into a bat at the window, the night behind him merged with the night around us. It was a good audience for a horror picture. Several people screamed, and once a whole bench turned over. A night breeze sighed in the tree, making the screen waver. Mary Alice kept her eyes shut through most of it. Grandma barely blinked. Afterward, we walked home in the dark. Mary Alice struck close to Grandma, and I wasn't far off myself. The town was just one show after another. When a big lilac bush threw leaf patterns on the wall ahead of us, Grandma shied like a horse. Then we came to an old oak tree growing close to the road. Grandma pulled back and edged around it like Count Dracula was standing on the other side, in a cape. Two or three years earlier, we'd have thought the movie had spooked Grandma. Now we wondered if she was trying to spook us. When we were safely inside at home, she made a business of lashing the screen door. Then she looked meaningfully at the window over by the sink, 
like Dracula's electric eyes might be staring in, out of this terrible thing to face. Mary Alice and I were frozen to the linoleum in spite of ourselves. Grandma, there aren't such things as vampires, are there? Mary Alice asked. Did she want to know or was she testing Grandma? Every summer, Mary Alice seemed to pick up another of Grandma's traits. Vampires? No. The only bloodsuckers is the banks. Grandma stroked her chins. Movies is all pretend. They're made in California, you know. But they prove a point. Make something seem real and people will believe it. The public will swallow anything. That seemed her last word for the night. Now Mary Alice and I had to stumble up the long staircase to the darkness above. Being the man of the family, I ought to have gone first, but didn't. Sweet dreams, Grandma said behind us. It was a long night and hot. Mary Alice shut her window to keep the vampire bats out. I know because I heard her closing hers when I was closing mine. The next morning, after that restless night, I said to Grandma at the breakfast table, I need two bucks bad. Well, who don't, Grandma said. What for? Driving lessons, and Ray Veach wants two dollars to teach me. Well, what do you want to learn to drive for anyway? She said, don't you go around Chicago in taxi cabs and trolleys? I couldn't explain it to Grandma. I was getting too old to be a boy, and driving meant you were a man. Something like that, I shrugged, and she slid a belly busting breakfast in front of me. Mary Alice turned up looking like a ghost of herself. She was pale faced with bags under her eyes. Though glad to see daylight, she was worn to a frazzle. Anyhow, Grandma said, you don't have time for driving lessons. I want you two to poke around in the attic. I can't get up there anymore. You have to climb up through a trap door in the closet. What are you looking for? Oh, I don't know, any old rummage for the church sale. So Grandma, who didn't take part in community activities, wanted to go to the rummage sale. She ate with fork in one hand, knife in the other. Then she looked up like she was having one of her sudden thoughts. Tell you what, find that old stovepipe hat up there. It belonged to a preacher who knew my ma and pa. He was visiting one time trying to convert them and he dropped dead on the parlor floor. They kept his stovepipe hat on their hat rack ever after to remember him by. I stuck it up there, get it down. I saw a picture in the paper of John D. Rockefeller in a hat just like that. They may be coming back in style. I doubted that last part, but Mary Alice and I dragged a ladder upstairs. Grandma followed as far as the second floor to show us where the trap door was. We were disappearing up into the attic when below us she said, watch yourselves, I might have bats in my belfry. We weren't familiar with attics, but this one wasn't too crowded. Grandma used up more than she saved. There were some three-legged chairs and a dress dummy half her size and some coal oil lamps from olden times. Mary Alice dodged cobwebs and tried not to brush against anything. I hate it up here, she said. But then we started going through a couple of old steamer trunks. I pulled a big furry buffalo robe out of mine. What about this? Mary Alice shrank. Don't touch, it's awful. It's got living things in it. She was right things with wings. I put it aside, and then I came to some baby clothes. Maybe dad's. Nothing too likely even for a rummage sale. Mary Alice's trunk was full of paper, yellowed farm journals, and buttons on cardboard, and a ton of dress patterns. And then she gasped. In her hand was an ancient valentine, a big heart surrounded by paper lace. The motto on it read, when Cupid sends his arrow home, I hope it misses you. Now, misses is spelled M-R-S. It was signed with a question mark. But Joy, who was, sent it, who was it sent to? Mary Alice wondered. Grandma, I guess. She got Valentine's? Mary Alice and I stared at each other. Then she found another one, also ancient, but without lace. When you're old and think you're sweet, take off your shoes and smell your feet. That sounds more like it, Mary Alice said. A voice of doom echoed up from the trap door. You find that stovepipe hat yet? I jumped and so did Mary Alice. The lid on her trunk dropped down on her head. 
Grandma was standing right under the trap door, listening to us and waiting for the stovepipe hat. I really, really hate this attic, Mary Alice said, whispering. The hat was in my trunk, and I handed it down to Grandma. It's getting too hot up here, Mary Alice said, and all these dress patterns are from before the war. But out of the bottom of her trunk, she pulled up an old quilt. It was so worn, you could see through it, and its pattern was fancy, but faded. How about this, she said to me. She was looking around the hem to see if the quilt maker had stitched in her initials, but the edges were all fraying away. What is it? said the trap door. An old quilt, we both yelled down. I forgot about that, Grandma hollered back. My Aunt Josie Small pieced that quilt. Drop it down. I did, and Grandma said, keep at it. We listened to her trudge away. Other trunks were tucked away under the eaves, so it took us all morning to go through everything. But we didn't find anything else any sane person would want in a thousand years. That afternoon, we walked uptown and a block beyond to the United Brethren Church. We weren't going for the lunch the Lady Circle was selling. We ate at home, but Grandma said they'd be offering free lemonade. She'd taken off her apron and wore a hat. Not her fine, fair-going hat. This was the one she gardened and fished in and nibbled at the brim. She tucked a fresh peony at the front of the crown to dress it up. She strolled along over the occasional sidewalks with the preacher's stovepipe hat in, in a grocery bag. Mary Alice wore her straw hat and a dress because we were going to church, more or less. I brought up the rear with Aunt Josie Small's quilt folded over my sweating arm. What's a church rummage sale like anyway? Mary Alice asked. Ever been in a hen house? Grandma said. The sale was in the church basement. The air was battered by funeral parlor fans and ladies were picking over long tables. Some were still bringing in their treasures and trash. Others were snatching things up and taking them to the cashier's card table to pay for them. A sharp scent of potato salad hung in the air, but the ladies' circle had cleared away lunch. Now they were bringing out pitchers of free lemonade. Everybody looked up when Grandma loomed into the room, as people always did. Several pulled back, but a tall, strict-looking lady came forth. Why, goodness, it's Mrs. Dowdle, she said. Grandma made short work of her by handing over the grocery bag and nodding at the quilt, which I offered up. Mary Alice went for a look at the merchandise, but the tables were surrounded by flying elbows, so I settled next to Grandma. She was on a folding chair, pouring herself a glass of lemonade. She had a way of sitting with her feet apart and her hands on her knees. After a good long swig of lemonade, she observed the scene. In fact, she was biding her time. Somehow I knew this. A flurry began at the other end of the table. From their hats, they were all town ladies, not country. A hiss of whispers whipped up into raised voices. Grandma sat on at her ease. Then the strict lady in charge, who was Mrs. Earl T. Askew, came through the crowds heading for us. Mrs. Askew's face had gone vampire white. Bending to Grandma, she spoke in low, urgent tones. Mrs. Dowdle, I feel I must tell you that Mrs. L.J. Wiedenbach, the banker's wife, has offered $15 for that stovepipe hat. She glared at Grandma for a restriction and got nothing back. Mrs. Dowdle, are you 100% sure you want to be part, part with that hat? It don't belong to me, Grandma made a small gesture. I have an idea it was in with some other old stuff Effie Wilcox threw away when the bank run her out of town. Mrs. Askew's gaze was electric. Other old stuff? She seemed to be having trouble breathing. Grandma nodded. Just some old clutter Effie found in the house back when she moved in. Mrs. Askew pivoted like a dancer and was gone. Already, Mrs. L.J. Wiedenbach was over at the cashier, peeling off $5 bills as fast as she could dig them out of her pocketbook. Oh, Grandma, I thought, what have you done? Mrs. Askew plunged back. Aunt Josie Small's quilt was clutched in her arms like a long-lost child. Mrs. Dowdle, she said. Oh, Mrs. Dowdle, are you 100%? Grandma took the quilt onto her lap and smoothed it out and looked it over. A crowd gathered. There in the corner, worked in the faded thread, initials, and magically appeared on the fraying hem. 
M T L. Suddenly, Mrs. Wiedenbach appeared, gripping the preacher's stovepipe hat. She went right for Mrs. Askew. What have you got there? Let me... Not so fast, Wilhelmina, Mrs. Askew snapped. I've seen... I saw it first. She swept up the quilt that Grandma gladly surrendered. What are those initials? Mrs. Wiedenbach was beside herself. Oh, my stars and garters. M.T.L. Mary Todd Lincoln. And I've got Abe Lincoln's own stovepipe hat. His names are lettered in on the sweatband. Two things happened the next morning. A car from out of town backfired in the vicinity of the bank, and everybody on the sidewalk dropped down and grabbed gravel. Who knew but what John Dillinger was alive and well, and up to his old tricks. The other thing was a knock at Grandma's front door right after breakfast. Mary Alice and I followed when she went to answer it, opening to a stringy young guy in a seersucker suit. Well, Otis, she said. What? Ma'am, he said, Mr. Wiedenbach would be pleased if you could spare him a moment of your time at your earliest convenience. Grandma stepped back and clutched her throat, showing shock. Don't tell me the banks failed. Banks is failing all over. Had I better draw out my funds? Is there time? No, ma'am, the bank is still in business. Otis looked down at his boots. Your $17 is safe. You give me a turn, she said, slapping at her bosom and shutting the door in his face. She waited an hour and a half. Then she put on her gardening hat and went uptown to the bank. Mary Alice and I went with her. When we got to the business block, people were still just getting up off the sidewalk. The bank was store-sized, and the only teller was Otis, back in his cage. He waved us, waved us through to the rear office beside the safe. I'd never seen Mr. Wiedenbach before, but this couldn't have been one of his better days. Over his head, on the wall above the desk, was a wide-mouthed bass stuffed. You'll have to excuse me, he boomed, showing us chairs. This crack brain rumor that Dillinger is still alive is doing our business no good. If it's a rumor at all, said Grandma, on her dignity and then some, a rumor is sometimes truth on the trail. I'm interested to hear you say so, Mrs. Dowdle. The banker pulled the purse strings of his mouth taut. It brings us to the point. Get right to it, Grandma said. Certain things supposedly from the estate of President and Mrs. Abraham Lincoln have surfaced in a house the bank is forced to floor clothes on. Do you grasp what this could mean, Mrs. Dowdle? Grandma thought she did. I expect the state will take that land and restore the house as a museum. I hear a rumor that Lincoln debated Douglas in that very parlor. Rumor has it he split the rails for the fence that used to enclose the brickyard. And who's been circulating such cockeyed rumors? The banker turned a deeper color. Who knows where rumors start, Grandma mused. Who knows where it'll end? They're very, very likely herded at the State House in Springfield by now. I have an idea they'll send over a historian any day now to snoop. Mrs. Dowdle, the bank has signed papers with Deer and Company to build an implement shed across that entire property and the site of the old brickyard, too. Any delay throws a monkey wrench in that deal. Better times are on the way, and what's good for a bank is good for the community. But a nice state park wouldn't be bad either, Grandma pondered. We could all set out on summer evenings recalling Honest Abe. What park we got now is just wasteland that the Wabash Railroad didn't want. Mr. Wiedenbach's gaping mouth hung near his blotter now. He had his desktop in a death grip. Mrs. Dowdle, you falsified those so-called Lincoln items. They're bogus. I could have the law on you. That's right, Grandma gazed above him at the wide-mouthed bass. The banker throws the poor old widow in the pokey. That'll look real good for your business. Mr. Wiedenbach was smaller now and deflated. Mrs. Dowdle, he said in a voice strangled with emotion, help me out of this. I'm in too deep with John Deere. I got to go forward because I can't do otherwise. Lop off your back end, Grandma said. I beg your pardon? Build a shorter implement shed over the old brickyard and leave Effie Wilcox's house be. 
A glimmer of hope showed in the banker's hard eye. I suppose we could go back to the drawing board and relocate and reallocate our square footage. Do that, Grandma said, and one more thing. You give Effie Wilcox back her house, free and clear. It isn't worth nothing anyway, apart from its historical value. Mrs. Dowdle, that's not business, the banker said. That's blackmail. What's the difference, Grandma said. A silence was observed. Then Banker Wiedenbach turned up his hands. All right, it's Mrs. Wilcox's house, free and clear. But you'll have to confess you falsified those so-called Lincoln items. Fair's fair. Well, Grandma sketched a casual pattern in the air with one hand. We can get that rumor going right now. Effie didn't mean to put Lincoln's name in the stovepipe hat. I, uh, she just lettered an A Lincoln to mean it was the kind of hat he wore. Mary and Alice and I exchanged a look across Grandma. And then MTL on the quilt. Shaw, Grandma said. Effie Wilcox had a cousin named Maud Teeter Lingenbloom. That's MTL for you. Mrs. Wiedenbach replied in an exhausted voice. I'll get the word out. Grandma was on her feet now. She patted the bun of her back hair under the nibbled brim. Free and clear, you got that? She said to Mr. Wiedenbach. Effie don't make no more payments on that house. Then, as if a sudden thought struck her, she nudged me. And you can give this boy here a $2 bill. She nudged Mary Alice. And that's fair as fair. Give the girl $2 too. Well, that's big money for young'uns, the banker said. Shall I draw it out of your account, Mrs. Dowdle? No, you double-dealing, four-flushing old cootie, she replied. You can draw it out of your own wallet. Any man with a wife will pay $15 for an old preacher's moth-eaten stovepipe, half for four bucks to spare. Silent wars seemed to wage in Mr. Wiedenbach's brain. Then he pulled his wallet out of his hip pocket. He kept a boot lace tied around it. We watched as he drew out a pair of $2 bills and handed them to Mary Alice and me. And heaven help us, we took them. Rumors are things with wings, too. The rumor that I had $2 reached Ray Veach before I could. He was going to have to give me my driving lessons at the end of the day, when he was sure his dad was out on the farm milking. Otherwise, his dad would take a cut. Also, we needed to use the Terraplane 8 which was strictly forbidden under an agreement with the Hudson Motor Car Company. I started off to raise that evening with a $2 bill in my jeans and a song in my heart. I felt like I was six feet tall and shaved. My right hand played through the gear shift positions and I was ready. Then Grandma called out after me that she and Mary Alice were going along for a ride. And how could I explain to Grandma that learning to drive was kind of a sacred thing and you don't want your kid's sister and your grandma along. Grandma filled most of the back seat of the terraplane. Mary Alice sat beside her with an unspent $2 bill in her pocketbook. From grandma, Mary Alice was learning thrift. She could squeeze two cents till they begged for mercy, let alone $2. Ray was up front with me, and I was behind the wheel. I'd crept out of town in second gear, and now Ray was showing me third. I knew if I got so much as a scratch on the fender that I was a dead man, so that kept me alert. And I stayed to the crown of the road, hoping not to meet anything oncoming. Visors flipped down to keep the setting sun out of her eyes. It was a car with every refinement, and though I wasn't steering straight yet, I was beginning to get the feel of the thing. The terraplane and I were becoming S1. I no longer let the motor die at the crossroads. After we made it across the plank bridge over Salt Creek, Ray reached down and turned the radio to WGN. Out of static came the sweet strains of cocktail hour music from the Empire Room at the Palmer House Hotel in Chicago, Illinois. It was a modern miracle. Here we were skimming along a country road past Cowgill's Dairy Farm and we were hearing music being played in the Chicago Loop. Grandma's head appeared between Ray's and mine. What in the Sam Hill's that noise, she said. Ray indicated the radio. Shut it off, she said. Let's listen to the country. So we did. 
Since a terraplane is another thing with wings, I edged up to 25 miles an hour watching the needle rise. Over the purr of the motor, we heard a wind pump squeaking as it turned out, a calf bawling, and Katie did st starting up in a grove of walnut trees. I see us yet, chasing the setting sun down the ribbon of road between the bean rows in the terraplane. I thought it was about a fine car as they'd ever make. I'm not so sure it wasn't. Grandma came to the depot with us on the day we were going home, but she wasn't there to see us off. She was there to meet Mrs. Effie Wilcox, who was coming home to her house. The Wabash Bluebird didn't exactly stop at Grandma's town. It only hesitated. As we were struggling to climb on, Mrs. Wilcox was struggling to get off. Her valise was full to bursting and her eyes were everywhere so I don't know if she spotted Grandma at first. But then somehow Mary Alice and I and our suitcase were on board and Mrs. Wilcox was on the platform and the bluebird was pulling out. Grandma didn't wave. Mrs. Wilcox was telling her something, but we waved anyway.